So, you want to self-publish a book? Well, let's talk. Hi, I'm MK Williams. I love sharing my insights about all things self-publishing with you. And today's video is part of the 2022 AuthorTube Writing Conference. So today, I'm diving into this question of, so, you want to self-publish a book? Well, where do we even start? I've been self-publishing since 2015, and I've learned a lot along the way. Most of it was done the hard way, as in I made earnest mistakes and then had to do time-consuming corrections. I'm here to help you sidestep those issues. In the time I've been publishing, I've put out a dozen books. From fiction to nonfiction, I put my books out there with my name on it. Then I had friends start to ask for help. I've been teaching and coaching authors since 2018 to help them get their books done and out there. So maybe I haven't seen it all, but I've seen a lot of it. So if you want to self-publish a book, where do you start? What are the steps? How do you do the putting into words and book format doing? Okay, well, that's exactly what we're going to go over today. Now, when I say that, I'm not saying that I have one true secret formula and therefore the only method or strategy for self-publishing. And if anybody does say that, run. Self-publishing runs a wide spectrum based on the author, the book that they're trying to put out, and their objectives for it. If anything, it can be frustrating to find out just how many options you have when it comes to self-publishing. Wait, what? Yes, you have a lot of different avenues you can pursue, and each person watching this video right now is writing a totally unique book with a different vision and set of goals. No two books are exactly alike, and therefore no two self-publishing plans and strategies are exactly the same either. At the end of this presentation, you'll likely have a better idea of each of the big elements you need to consider, as well as a solid to-do list in terms of what happens next with writing, publishing, and marketing your book. I'm going to have a list of resources in the description for this presentation, so you can check out additional videos, books, and more to get you on your journey. Okay, so let's dive in. So before we go any further, we're going to check yourself. First and foremost, do you really want to self-publish? Or do you see this as your second option since you couldn't get a traditional deal? Know yourself. If you think that this is just your backup option, you're going to self-sabotage. And by that, I mean at every step in the journey, you're going to just stall, delay, wait, submit your book again for agents, get frustrated, and generally just not get the book published. I've seen it happen multiple times. So have you really thought about self-publishing and all that it entails? Perhaps after watching this presentation, you'll have a better idea of whether you think this sounds awesome and empowering, or if you think, no, not for me. Either option is totally fine. You and your book are unique. You need to work with what works best for you. But you know yourself. You know what your gut is telling you. And if you aren't in this 100%, I can guarantee it's not going to be successful. Second, Self-publishing is not solo publishing. It's not solitary publishing. Accountability and encouragement from friends, family, and loved ones are going to be what you need to get you through this. You need someone in your corner. This is a long process from all of the writing and editing and then, oh yeah, making it a book and then, oh yeah, publishing it and promoting it. It really never ends. But your life is still going on while all this is happening. Work stress, family problems, car repairs. So many things can and will pop up that will derail you. Having a support person to encourage you helps. And if you don't feel that you have a friend to support you or a family member or partner to cheer you on, then guess what? Welcome to the indie author community. We love that you are here and we can't wait to cheer you on every step of the way. But the most important thing is don't do this alone. And second to that, in addition to the encouragement and accountability, is outsource something. It's hard to be a one-person publishing house. So you know which areas are your weak spots. Hire someone to design your cover or format your book or to coach you through the process. You can learn everything the hard way and the lonely way, or you could pay for some assistance. I'll go over budgeting and costs later, but at the outset, have it in your mind that something has to be done by somebody else. I slogged through for years trying to do it all on my own. It was super isolating and difficult when it didn't need to be. And when I look back, those are some of my biggest mistakes, which is keeping myself in isolation and not asking for help and not working with people who knew better than me at the time.
This next part is super critical to self-publishing, and that's defining your goals, your vision, and what success looks like for you. Yes, before we write a word, before we look at ISBNs, before we go down a YouTube rabbit hole of information, first and foremost, I want you to define your goals and your vision for your book. Your goal could be to see your book on a shelf. Maybe it's your shelf. Maybe it's in your local bookstore shelves. Maybe it's your library shelves. Maybe your goal is to make enough to quit your job. Maybe you just want to make enough for this hobby to pay for itself. You can have more than one goal, but you have to have one primary goal. And let me tell you, there's a lot of people out there who will gladly give you their goal and you'll gladly take that because you think, well, of course I want to be a New York Times bestseller. Was that your initial goal? then keep your eyes on your own paper. It's very easy to get distracted through all of the different decisions that you need to make and what goes into it. And then at the end, you think, well, I just wanted to get my book out there. I just wanted to have something to hold in my hands. If that's your goal, that's your goal. Um, I don't want you to get distracted by all the other shiny, glittery things around you that aren't your goal, that are somebody else's goal Um, for their book, for their genre, for where they are in their author career focus on your goal, all right? And you need to have a primary goal. You can have secondary goals because some people think, well, my goal is to get the book out so my family can see it. And yeah, I want to be able to quit my day job. Okay, well, those are two very different goals. And one of them has to be primary because the book that you'll make that just satisfies your urge and your desire to be a published author and to hand something to your family is very different than the book you would write to be able to make enough money to quit your day job. Two very different things. Maybe your desire is to write um, in a popular genre that is very lucrative. Okay, then that might work together. Um, But the decisions that you'll make along the way will be different. Um, So it is important to have your primary goal and understand which ones are your secondary goals. Great if you hit those goals. If you don't, it wasn't your primary goal. Okay. And the second is your vision for your book. Okay, you likely already have this in your mind. When you think of self-publishing your book, you see what? Anyone can fill the answer in for you. And, and a vision, not a daydream, right? Hitting the New York Times bestseller list is a dream. It's not a vision. Because the vision in that case is a lot of pounding the pavement, paying for PR, you know, hustling with every co- connection you have, um, probably shelling out a lot of money to know a person who knows a person who knows a person um, to get you on some of these major shows. So what is your vision for your book? It's really easy to get distracted by other visions and dreams or even what their success is. And once you understand your goals and your vision, then you know what you are defining as success for your book, right? So if your goal is to get your book published before your next birthday, by the way, never make your launch day your birthday. Don't do it. Don't do it. It's going to be miserable. You're going to be stressed out on your birthday, on your day. No, you'd be stressed out on somebody else's day. That's, That's an extra little tidbit. Okay. But once you have your goals and your vision, then you understand what defining success is for you, whether that's I want this book published by a specific time, I want it to come in with this budget, and I want to earn this much to earn it back or make so much in revenue, or I just want to see a family member hold this book, Um, whatever that goal and vision is, then that defines your success, not somebody else's, yours, okay? And I know I've been going on for this a little bit, but this is, I think, the most important part of self-publishing because I see so many authors get burned out chasing somebody else's hamster wheel, right? They're going after somebody else's goal and they forgot what their original goal was. They forgot what their original reason for doing this was and they're not satisfied. They're not happy because they're not focusing on what their success metrics were. Um, and I think it's really important to to write it down, to put it up on a sticky note on the wall or on your fridge or somewhere to say like, this is what my vision of success is. Now, granted, from book to book, if you self-publish more, even as you go through, you may change that definition. You're just kind of like, well, I realize getting this published by my birthday. Again, don't publish on your birthday. It just isn't realistic. It's not going to happen. Let me adjust my goal. Okay, that's fine. Um, But I don't want you to start just going after somebody else's goal. That's the big thing. Okay. Now with that, you know, you have your your goals and your vision and success. There, there's budgeting we need to keep in mind, right? And the first thing we need to budget is your time. Because time is one thing you cannot get any more of. 
Nope. Money, you can go and earn more money. You can do other hobbies um, or side hustles to like fund your book for self-publishing. Um, but your time, you'll never get back once it's spent. So whether it's the time that you're writing or your time to look up publishing stuff and kind of setting everything up to publish or marketing, like I want you to budget time for that. This could be daily, this could be weekly, this could even be monthly, but let's identify when you're going to do this work. Do you have time you can easily carve out into each day or week? Uh, you know you know your life circumstances, right? If your life's maybe a little hectic and you just think like, I just need to have a mini retreat weekend at a local hotel and I can just get this done. Um, you know your budget, obviously, financially and, and your time. Um, you may think like, I don't, I can't even do that, you know, and it may not seem like much, but 20 minutes a day every day or a couple hours on the weekend does add up. I do think eventually you'll, you'll start to realize like, what are the things I can move around? Um, I've, I've said this before. I don't watch TV. I just don't have the time. I don't watch TV, especially now that I have a daughter, like my free time. I'm just, I want to read. I want to be done thinking for the day. Um, now you may think I have my favorite shows. I'm not going to give them up. Well, you don't have to give them up forever, but for the time that you're writing the book and putting this in, can you put that on pause? And then you can just binge that series later. Um, is that something that you could do, you know, carve out the time and commit to it and have it on the calendar and make sure those people who your accountability buddies are, they know. Um, so that way you can do that. Now, obviously it, you, you need to give yourself a break at some point, but make that the exception, not the rule um, to really dedicate the time. Now, one thing that I will say for self-publishing is that this takes about a year. Some people do rapid release and can crank out books every quarter. And, and in general, those people are much more experienced with self-publishing. They know all the platforms already. They know their strategy. They have all of the people that they outsource things to in place. Um, and they, this may be their full-time job, right? If you have a full-time job that is not writing and self-publishing, it's going to take at least a year might even take 14 months. Um, and so if this is your first book, it's a lot of pressure to put on yourself to do a rapid release model with one book a quarter. Um, in general, based on my own books and the books that I've helped to put out in the world, it takes at least a year. Um, unless you're retired and not working and have no children, then three months is Sure, you could probably rush it and do that, but I think it's a it's too much pressure on yourself. Um, and when I tell people, it takes you like, well, I saw so and so has this thirty days to write a bestseller, and I'm like, I wonder how long that book stayed at the bestseller list that if it was rushed in thirty days. Um, and so one of the things I always tell people is this is if your goal is to just make money, pick pick a different way to make money. Um, you know, if you just want to make money quickly, there are lots of other side hustles or things that you could do. Like if you're self publishing a book, it takes time to write and edit um, and put everything together. And I, 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 it breaks my heart when I see people who rush this um, and then they're disappointed with the results. And I think, well, it's because you rushed. Um, or they are meticulous with their draft and their manuscript and that takes them a year. And then think, well, I just need to get it published next week okay, you spent all this time working on it and then you're going to rush the actual making it a book part. Um, that doesn't make sense. So I want you to give yourself that grace and that time. Um, and I said that's about a year. Some people I've worked with have been able to do it quicker, especially if it was a shorter book or like a children's book, even though the illustrations do take time. If it's less text, it's obviously faster for editing and revisions to come back. Um, I've seen some people where it's taken much longer than a year um, because of life circumstances that were going on for them and um, some of the elements of their book that were a little bit more complicated. So plan for a year. And again, don't, don't launch the book on your birthday. Don't do it. Okay. All right. The next thing we have to budget after our time is our effort. You only have so much energy. So if you're going to write the book, then you have to self-publish it and market that's a lot. Um, sometimes when you think I'm going to write today, you sit down and then, nah, nope, the words are not coming. Um, and this is the time for you to do your research on your self-publishing strategy, listen to podcasts to help you with your business side, jot down marketing ideas. There's always something to be doing when you are a self-publishing author. Um, it's maintaining your backlist. It's even promoting the backlist like after your book is out. So um, when you have that time allotted for your effort and your energy, make sure you're still looking at that, whether you're keeping a journal or a Google Doc or in a task manager like Asana, a Trello, like ongoing lists of things that you want to be researching or doing. 
And just know like if the words just aren't coming today, that's your time to look at that. And as I said before, every so often you do need to give yourself time for rest. Um, you get more creative when your brain isn't maxed out. And so I want you to give yourself some grace there. Um, but it doesn't have to be the scheduled in. Well, I can only take my break time on this day and it's not that day. Like if your brain needs a break today, take the break today and then work on that other day. It's fine. And now we're finally going to get to the part of budget that's about money because how do you know how much money to budget when you don't even know what to do yet? We haven't talked about that. So as I continue to go through this presentation, I'll call out some areas where I think it would be a good investment, as in it will take longer for you to learn to do it for free um, than it will just to hire somebody to do it outright. Like your time has value and there are certain things that I think can benefit you. Um, now, some of the things that have a cost associated with them um, are editing services. Um, if you were to hire somebody, even if you say, okay, I'm not going to hire an official editor because I'm on a tight budget, but I have beta readers and they're going to help me. Like you maybe want to still give your beta readers like a gift certificate to Starbucks or a thank you gift, or at the very least, you're going to send them a copy of the book when it's done. That, you know, if it's a print copy that has a cost associated with it. Um, you want to think about cover design. Very few of you watching have the graphic design skills and the book industry knowledge to design your own cover. Don't do what I did. Just hire someone. Okay. Um, so cover design, interior formatting, um, not just for print, but also for eBooks. Um, marketing. Um, now, I think there's a lot of places you can spend money on marketing and you will just buy. Buy money. Buy. Buy. See you never. Um, it's just, uh, I don't want to say it's a waste, but I think it, it can be a waste if you don't have other things in place. Um, and I actually talk about that in my book, Book Marketing for the First Time Author. All the, the non-paid things that you should have in place first before you spend a single dollar on advertising. Because if those other items aren't in place first, none of that money spent is going to mean a thing. Um, like if you, you're starting to do ads and you don't have any reviews for your book, that that's probably not going to turn out too well. Um, if you're paying somebody to go and do PR for you, but you haven't, you don't even have a website. Um, I don't know how people are going to find you if they want to book you for any interviews. Um, so little things like that. So I'm going to call it throughout where I think you should spend money and where I think you can save. Um, I know there, I'm kind of just putting a disclaimer. I know there's going to be other people in this conference who talk very strongly about editing needs. And I absolutely agree. Like you need a strong editor, you need a strong editing team, but you also know your budget. And if this is your very first time out, you may look at some of the rates that editors charge for developmental or story editing, then for copy editing, then for final proofing and think, I don't have that kind of money sitting around. And there are ways you can get quality feedback to help you revise your book. But just know that if you're asking a friend for editing advice, you may get a friend's response, which is, this is great. I love it. Maybe they're just trying to be nice to you. So I will say if there's ever a time, whether you're hiring an editor as well, if you're working with beta readers or alpha readers, um, and again, this is regardless of whether you then go on to hire a professional editor who doesn't know you personally, if you're sending this to friends and family members, make sure they like the genre that you write in. Um, otherwise, they're going to just be like, mm -hmm, that's great. I loved it. Mm, I don't want to read that. Um, and let them know this exact phrase. I would rather hear criticism from you, my friend or my family member in private than hear it from trolls online once the book is published, because that's going to give them the permission they need to give you the feedback that you're looking for. Again, when it comes to money, um, some of you may think spend it all top of the line. Um, OK, good for you if you want to invest in my books, I will take the money. Some of you may think, nope, I'm not, I want to spend as little as possible because I just don't have the budget. And I think the best strategy is going to lie somewhere between there. Um, I would say doing it all for free by yourself. Again, that's where I made all of my mistakes was just hunkering down, being stubborn, um, refusing to pay for help or even ask for help from people um, for advice, um, and then having to learn the hard way. Um, I do think just top of the line, everything, um, you're probably not going to see the ROI you want. Those are my thoughts on money. Um, 
So we'll go there. Again, every person has their own strategy. Every person is coming into this with a different um, perspective. If you already have a large organic audience or following on a platform, marketing is going to be easier for you than somebody who's coming in with no followers. And maybe you don't have to spend as much on the marketing and you have more to invest on design and things like that. So we all come from different places. This is the part in this video where we're going to start to actually talk about self-publishing strategy. And what I want you to do is I want you to actually watch this entire video all the way through before you start doing things. Like if you found this and you're like, cool, I'm going to upload today. Let me just skip to this section. No, um, I want you to listen to all of it first. And it's kind of that um, this happened to me in second grade. And I'm sure it's happened to you at some point in your life, in your elementary school, where you're learning about please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, PEMDAS, the order of operations for math. And we came in one morning and we had a pop quiz on, on our desks. Now, I am good at math. I will admit that. I am a huge math nerd. I've always been good at math in school. I actually want to be a math teacher. Like, I love math. I'm a super nerd. And so we came in for a pop quiz and I was like, I have to get an A on this. This is my thing. And we all sat down at our desk and it was, this is in second grade, it was an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper and it was full of one of one equation. And we were supposed to use order of operations to start to solve the things in the brackets and things like that and get the answer. And so at the top, it said, read the equation entirely before you start working on it. And we were told you have 15 minutes. Well, I'm in the second grade, like <laughs> it's an entire page. I was like, I need to just get to work. And so everyone in class has their heads down, they're working and I see a few other kids pop up and they're already done. And that stresses me out. Instead of taking that as a cue of like, you're missing something here, MK. I was like, I'm the best at math in this class. I have to finish first what is going on, freaking out. And so the 15 minutes is up. I did not finish the page long equation. Fun fact. Um, and only a few kids passed because only a few kids read the entire equation, which at the very end said times zero. Answer was zero which I, if I had read the entire equation, I would have known that. What does this long-winded anecdote from my trials as an elementary schooler have to do with self-publishing? I want you to read the entire equation before you start going. I want you to listen to this entire presentation. I want you to do your research before you start making decisions because you might go down a path and realize, oh, that's not what I meant to do or okay, that doesn't work with my strategy or that's going to box me in here or I don't want exclusivity here or I want to be in a library, but now I'm exclusive. So what do I do? Um, I want you to map out what you think your strategy will be now. I want you to kind of turn it over in your mind. I want you to do your research. I want you to feel confident in your strategy before you create a single account with any of these self-publishing platforms before you upload a thing, before you tell people the release date for your book. Um, so yes, I want you to read the entire equation um, so you can make sure it's not all time zero. If you feel like you're learning about all this and you think, nope, I don't want to do this or that's not going to work. Um, I want you to go through everything. Okay. So now we're going to dive into your self-publishing strategy, and I hope you have a notebook. You can start to take some notes here. Um, I do discuss all of this in my Author Your Ambition books as well, self-publishing for the first-time author, book marketing for the first-time author, going wide, how to write your first novel, the entire suite. Um, so if you want more details on those, I'll have that link below. Um, but your self-publishing strategy is something that you need to take some time to think on. Thankfully, as you're writing your book, you will have time to sit with your ideas and what you want to see if something is right for you. As you do all your research, you're going to hear about a lot of different options and, and tactics. And that's why I wanted you to define your vision and your goals first, because there's lots of shiny objects. Um, I always advocate that you have your primary goal and vision in place, um, but that you have the ability to adapt and adjust your strategy as your author career evolves. So what works for you on book one may not be the right strategy and option on book four or five. Namely, there might be new platforms, there might be new requirements or restrictions that things could change. Um, but I want you to have build in that adaptability as well. So the first thing we're going to talk about in your self-publishing strategy are the formats that your book will be available in. So we need to understand what are the different methods readers can have to access your book. These are your formats. So if somebody says, what's the book format? This is what they're talking about. Now, ebook, 
there's print, um, which could be paperback or hardcover, um, or audiobook. Now, within each of these, there are different means, right? So within ebooks, you can have an EPUB file, a Mobi file. You can even have like an editable PDF or just a PDF. Within print, I mentioned paperback or hardcover. There could also be spiral bound. There are audiobooks. You could actually do just digital MP3s now, but some people may still say, no, I want a CD. I want cassettes. No one does that anymore, but maybe that's what you want and that's good for you. So each platform that I will go over allows for a different combination of these formats. Some allow you to publish just ebooks. Some allow you to do ebook um, and print books. Um, there's none that allow you to truly do all three. Um, you might be saying, what about Amazon? Mm, those are two separate platforms for audiobooks and for um, ebooks and print. So I um, want you to keep that in mind um, that whatever you pick as your formats, you then need to keep in mind which platforms allow you to publish those. Um, there's a good chance you're going to have an ebook and a print book for your book. Um, audiobooks can be more expensive to create, so you may elect to add that on later. Um, and for some people, you may say you only want print, um, especially if you're creating a workbook that requires the reader to write in the book. So what I want you to think about with these different formats is this. So first of all, you can't link things in a print book. I know so many bloggers who've turned into book authors who just think they can do a hot link um, to give credit to the information source as they would have done on their blog. Love that you're giving credit, but you cannot do that. Um, in print, no one can click on the link. You can't can't get to it. Um, so I would say regardless, and I would say even in the ebook, you don't want that because you don't want to take the reader away from your book. Anything that brings the reader out of your book somewhere else is going to keep them from finishing the book and leaving a review. Okay. So regardless of whether you take that advice or not for your ebook, you need to have an official bibliography in the back of your book. I don't care if you have hot links in the body of your book, you need to have a bibliography at the end of your book. Um, if you are citing sources, obviously, if you're making up fiction and it's all just made up in your head. You don't need a bibliography. Um, but if you have sources, they need to be in your bibliography um, at the back of the ebook of the print book. You need a bibliography. Two, I will say that things um, that you can say in print will be different in audio. Um, now, whether that's images and graphs um, or if it's just if your book is very visual heavy, you need to make sure your words do their job so someone listening to the audiobook can still follow along with what you're telling them. Also, things like as you can see below, as you can see above, or as you can see on the next page, that doesn't work in audio. So these are little things I want you to keep in mind as you're deciding what formats am I going to have my book available in because then you can almost like keep notes on the manuscript, whether you're using MS Word or Google Docs or any of the other platforms that allow you to write books. Um, you can always leave a note that says, I need to change this for audio or I need to change this for the ebook. It's, I can't hot link or things like that. Um, just keep that in mind. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about in our strategy is the retailers. Now, retailers are different from your self-publishing platforms. Retailers are where people will go to purchase the book. So retailers are separate from the self-publishing platforms. Okay, repeat after me. The retailer is separate from the self-publishing platform. There are limited exceptions to this, but as you think about where you want customers to buy your book, the retailer, you then work backwards to figure out which platforms can get you access there, okay? Now, some retailers and platforms have a one-to-one -one relationship. So Kindle Direct Publishing is the self-publishing platform that has a one-to-one -one relationship with Amazon.com, the retailer. Um, that's a perfect example of that one-to-one -one relationship. But some self-publishing platforms can get you to multiple retailers, which is very convenient. Um, again, going back to budgeting your time and your effort, how many of these different platform logins and tax information do you want to maintain? Um, the main thing to remember is that you do not want duplicate listings on your retailer's site. It creates a big old mess. So as you start to evaluate which retailers you want to be on and back into the platform, you want to make sure you don't have any overlap. Um, do not, do not sign up for every self-publishing platform that's out there and say, well, I'm just going to click publish on all of them. You're going to have duplicate listings. You need to have a very um, clear to-do list with which platforms you will up to upload to first, which ones you will deselect from an aggregator to make sure you do not have a duplicate listing. This is, again, why I want you to look over the strategy. I know people who said, yep, yep, this is my strategy. I'm just going to use this aggregator and this direct, and that's it. I'm going to have it all covered. And they uploaded things, and they thought, well, I just heard about this, this platform, so I'm going to upload here to you and upload here. And then they had issues, and I can't fix it at that point. 
and the author couldn't fix it at that point. They had to wait for customer service at all of these companies to get back to them and figure it out. It was a big old mess. Hence, we're going to have a strategy and we're going to have a plan and we're going to read the entire equation before we start solving for anything. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So now that we've talked about the retailers, um, retailers being Amazon, Barnes & Noble, Bookshop.org, Kobo, Target, Apple Books, etc., we're going to talk about the self-publishing platforms. Now, these are the services that you will log into and you will publish your book on, um, and they will get it out to the retailers. Um, now, I did mention before direct, the one-to-one -one relationship versus these aggregators. Um, now, for one one for one or, or direct, you have KDP getting you to Amazon.com. You have Barnes and Noble Press getting you on BarnesandNoble.com. You have Kobo Writing Life getting you onto Kobo.com. You have Apple Books getting you onto Apple Books, etc. You have um, Audiobook Creation Exchange getting you onto Audible. Um, now, actually, ACX is a bit of an aggregator. They get you to Audible, Amazon, and Apple. But um, aggregators are the services that you're going to upload once and it's going to get you to many retailers. Um, so that's going to save you some time. So that's like Ingram Spark, Draft to Digital, Smashwords, Find Away Voices. And again, ACX is technically an aggregator, but they're really, they're, it's Amazon. It's Amazon. So Amazon.com and Audible, the fact that they're considered two different, they are two different retailers or two different retail websites, but it's all the same company. It, it all goes to Jeff Bezos. Okay. Um, now, each platform has their own specific upload process. Now, these are usually fairly easy to understand and straightforward. Um, they've all been optimized for user experience. So I don't want you to stress out like, well, I have to pick this aggregator because they have the best upload process. Like, no, they're, they're, they're all kind of similar. Um, now, some will have a few added things. Um, for example, with KDP, Kindle Direct Publishing, um, to publish on Amazon.com, you can enroll in their different marketing programs, but they're going to require exclusivity for your ebook. Is that something that you want? Do you want to be exclusive only to Amazon? That's up to you. Yes or no? Like, you know, that's a choice you have to make. Um, or certain things like if for aggregator Ingram Spark, you have to approve a digital print proof of your book before it is distributed to their network. Um, so you're not just going to upload it and it's available for sale that day. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. So um, each each platform has these slightly different little things about it. And again, I'm going to have a bunch of videos linked below where you can kind of go through the ins and outs of each of them um, to learn more. But I don't want you to make a decision based on, well, this platform is easier to upload to than another. They're all fairly simple and straightforward. I want your decision to be based on which platforms will get you the reach um, to the retailers that are part of your vision and your goals. Um, I will also say that these are all websites. It's technology glitches can and do happen, um, but you can't control that. Um, but you can control your reactions to it and your patience. And, um, you know, it, I understand the frustration when somebody had their heart set on, my book was supposed to come out today, or I, or I don't have it, or, you know, there's this glitch in the upload process. And, you know, other dreams are just imploding around them. And I understand the stress in that moment, going on different boards, going on social media and blasting these companies and saying, they didn't get back to me right away. They're horrible. Um, that's not going to help them want to respond to you any faster. Like this, for as much as self-publishing is a growing community, I will say it's also a small community. Um, and you don't want to be the person who's constantly like, the sky is falling, the sky is falling, the sky is falling. When it's like, can you, can you just go and have like a sip of water and maybe like a, a snack? And then come back and see see if they've gotten back to you. Um, and, and partially, I used to work in a customer service role. And like I, I was on the receiving end of like, you messed this up. And I was like, I did not do anything. I showed up to work today and you called and yelled at me. Um, so keep in mind that the person you're speaking to is not trying to ruin your book launch or ruin your life or destroy your book or anything. Like there are glitches that happen with these technologies and you need to pack your patience because it's going to happen. And it's never going to happen at a convenient time. So keep that in mind. So now that we've gone over the strategy, the some of the strategy decisions for the format your book will be in, the retailers that it will be on, and then therefore the platforms you will select um, to get your book to those retailers. Um, and again, I'm going to have a bunch of links for multiple rabbit holes you can travel down um, to check those out. Um, now we're actually going to talk about the process of self-publishing. 
like, you know, actually writing the book and making it a book and doing the thing. Um, we finally arrived here at the part where you are writing your book. Yay. Um, but to be honest, you may have already written your book or at least started it. Um, before deciding to think about the strategy. Um, so when I started out in 2015 and had days that the word just wouldn't come, that's when I did my research instead. And so I don't want you to feel like, but I have a finished draft. Like it's too late. It's never too late. Um, you, it's always fixable. Um, that's what I say in self-publishing. There are no true emergencies. There, it's it's fixable on a long enough time schedule and with a big enough budget. It's all fixable. Um, obviously, it's nice to get it right the first time and not be stressed out. So the first phase of self-publishing your book is writing it. Hands down, you have to write the book to publish it. Um, so this process is going to include writing, self-edits and revisions, um, getting feedback from maybe alpha readers um, or initial feedback from a developmental editor. Um, now, some people say developmental editors co-write the book with you. Some say, no, they're just editors who kind of point out plot holes. Um, it seems to me that of the different people I've worked with who are in that role of a developmental editor, they all have their own definition of what they do. So um, if somebody wants to charge you $20,000 for a developmental edit, they're gonna ghostwrite the book with you. That's them co-writing the book with you. If they're gonna charge you based on words and length, then they're gonna read the book and tell you where there's plot holes. Okay. Um, after you get that feedback, you're going to do some more edits and revisions. Then you might send it out to beta readers um, to get feedback from people. I always say a, a, sh a small number of beta readers who are actually going to read the book and get you the feedback you're looking for are better than like 100 beta readers and you hear back from two of them. Um, you always want to provide a date when things are due by. And then you are not going to look at the feedback until you have all of it back. Because I know people who have gotten feedback from one beta reader. Oh, I'm going to rewrite my book based on all that. And then this other beta reader said something else. So I'm going to rewrite it again. Oh, and this third person said something. And so I went back to the original draft. Um, you're going to waste a lot of time. What you're looking for from alpha readers or beta readers is a consensus of what isn't working or what could be improved. And you want to be telling them what to look out for of saying like, I think this character is weak, or I think I don't necessarily make my point here. Um, open-ended what could be improved, um, but give them some guidance. Um, now, after beta readers, you may work with a copy editor. You may send things to people for um, alpha reading, um, for like story feedback, and they just send you back grammatical fixes, which, hey, that's helpful. Um, not what I was looking for, but still helpful. So um, again, you'll decide wh where you're going to invest your money on editing. Um, so having worked with in indie publishers, you know, they're paying for the developmental edit, somebody to really go through and make sure this is on trend with the genre in terms of people are going to understand this when they read it. Um, it is not going to leave the reader like this is not what I was looking for. Um, all of the points being made make sense, all of the plot points, all of the points as far as like if it's a nonfiction, um, and then paying for potentially two copy edits um, where somebody's going through and saying, yep, I am reading this to see this number here doesn't match this number here or this name here doesn't match this name here or you're using this rule on the Oxford comma for the first three chapters and then you're using this other rule over here um, and really pointing that out you would do one copy edit make your revisions and then the second um, because you don't want to be having duplicate or branching edits um, where you have one person saying this and one person saying that you want to go with one than the other um, now again you may be thinking like I don't have the budget for that um, and that's where you, we all have the friends who are the grammar grammar police maybe you ask them to help with that um, and so again one thing to keep in mind I know there are some people who swear like nope you have to pay for an editor they have to come from traditional publishing and not be freelancing um, you're going to pay a lot more for that there are more people out there who are freelancing their editing services um, and having a good beta reader group or a good critique circle can help you to get those improvements and save on those points of investment that's what I'll say. Um, yes. Um, there is a marketplace called Readsy where you can find editors like this. Again, I'll have a link below. You can check that out. Um, I do think that's a great place where you can find somebody. Um, and again, like I said, with the indie author community, you can just ask someone, well, who do you use? Um, you know, do they have any availability? Um, you want to make sure that whoever the editor is, like they read in your genre. <laughs> um, I wouldn't ask somebody who mainly works on like... Um, high fantasy like think game of thrones to read my sci-fi books um because it's too different 
genres. Like if they're an expert in one genre or one type of book, respect that um, and find somebody who's maybe has more expertise in your type of book. Um, so after all of this, after writing and you're doing self edits and you're getting story um, development and feedback, and yes, if you have a nonfiction book, there is still a story there. If there isn't, maybe work on that. Um, self edits, beta readers, copy edits, things like that, you're going to do a final pass. And I always recommend the final pass being to read the book aloud, because your brain will fill in when you're missing the word of. Um, if you're just reading it on the page, and other people may do that too, if they're really getting engrossed in the book. Um, so reading it aloud helps. I've even just in this past week decided I'm not going to read it aloud anymore, because my brain will still skip over things. If I meant to write the and I wrote that, my brain will just say the. Um, and so Microsoft Word actually has a read aloud function. It sounds like a robot. But I was able to hear I'm like, oh, that wasn't that wasn't the word. It was supposed to be this, not that. Um, literally this, not that. Um, and so I was able to fix it. So that's actually really helpful to get that final, like before you send it anywhere, like this is your final chance. This is this is the done manuscript. Um, now, that those were six steps in there that I said, writing, self-edits, story development, more edits, copy edits, read aloud. Those are six steps there. Um, I don't want you to spend a decade refining and refining and refining your book, that's too long. I don't want you to only spend a week refining your book, that's too short. Um, I would say a couple months of revisions um, help. And having these steps where you're sending it to somebody else, you're getting feedback, you're sending it to somebody else, you're, you know, you're getting the feedback and you're making the edits is going to really help you because during the time when your book is away with somebody else and you're not touching it because it's away with somebody else, ideas are going to percolate for how maybe you can fix a plot hole or, oh no, I can't publish this book without putting XYZ in there. Like this is super important. So it's going to give you the time to really make sure that this is set everything that you want. Um, and then doing that final proof on your eyes. Don't just assume, um, never just hit accept all on everybody's edits either. Um, because people's edits may be like, do you want to do this rule or this rule? So you actually have to read through the edits. Um, so that is six steps within the writing and editing process. Um, so keep that in mind. Don't take forever on it, but don't rush it. Like I think a good three to four months of editing. There you go. Maybe that's a little much, but also like when you send people your book out to people, you have to keep in mind that they have a life and your book is your top priority, not theirs. And so you want to give them time to read the book and get you feedback. Um, most editors I work with say usually minimum six weeks. Sometimes they get it back sooner, but they say minimum is six weeks. Like just plan for six weeks and if I get it to you sooner, that's great. Um, so that is something to keep in mind as well, why you should not be rushing your deadline. Okay. Kind of before we close out the writing and editing phase, we're actually gonna move into the technical setup phase. Several of these phases overlap with each other. Um, and so I don't want you to think, okay, like I finished writing, editing, and then I go to setting up and publishing because there's a little bit of finesse over the two. Um, and so I call this next phase that we'll discuss like the technical setup, because this is where you take off your author hat and you're going to put on your publisher hat. So you'll need to make sure that you have your ISBN, copyright page, barcodes, book description, keywords, cover interior formatting taken care of in this phase. Um, that's a lot. With our technical setup, we have ISBNs, copyright, barcodes. Oh my, I have tons of videos on these three elements and I probably could have just made my whole presentation just about this topic. So I'm gonna give you a very, very high level review here. So for starters, your ISBN, your copyright, and your barcode are three totally separate things. They're different and they should never be used interchangeably at all. And if you start to hear somebody talking about a barcode or an ISBN or copyright, and it sounds like they're talking about the other thing, stop them, ask them to clarify. Um, I see it used interchangeably a lot in this space. Um, and it is my number one pet peeve. Um, and, and I see a lot of people who are doing videos about ISBNs, and they'll use a barcode on their their thumbnail like thing about what the video is about. And I'm like, stop it. Stop it. You're perpetuating this misinformation. Barcodes are not the same thing as ISBNs. Okay, getting off my soapbox. All right, so ISBNs are effectively the social security number for your book. And that's the easiest way to understand it, but each format gets its own number. So a book with an ebook format, a paperback format, and a hardcover format has three ISBNs, but it's all one creative work. That means 
if you elect to register your copyright, you need only one copyright registration. Um, now, copyright registration is an extra step to protect your creative work above what you are already guaranteed by your country. So in the US, the second you create something, it's protected under US copyright law. But the registration helps to prove it should you ever need to defend a claim. Um, it's at the time of this recording, it is $65 um, for US citizens and residents to register their copyright with a US copyright copyright office. Um, so again, $65, you might think, oh, sure, no problem. Easy. Um, you might also think that's a lot of books I have to sell to earn that back. Um, ISBNs, depending on your country, you may have to purchase them or you may not. Um, um, again, I have a ton of videos on that and I will have links um, for the official body where you should purchase your ISBNs from if you have to purchase them. Um, they are non-transferable. So when people say, oh, like go with my service, you get an ISBN they hold the ISBN, not you. Um, and my opinion is that if you're going through all this work and effort and spending all this money to create your book, why would you not own your ISBN and have that ability to take it with you to any platform um, at any time? Because some of these platforms may not be around in a decade or there may be new ones um, or new things that you want to explore. And I always think you should own your ISBN. I'm getting back off my soapbox. You can tell I really could have made the entire presentation about this topic of all the soapboxes I am getting on. Um, and I do have a playlist of videos that's all about different countries where you would get your ISBNs and copyright and barcodes and things like that. So link below. Um, now, barcodes, those are the things you see on the back of any physical good that helps retailers with point of sale um, and inventory. If you don't plan to have a print version of your book, you don't need one of these. If you're only going to have a digital version of your book, like an ebook or um, a digital file audiobook, you don't need a barcode. Don't even worry about it. If you don't plan to get your books into brick and mortar retailers, then you can use the free no price barcodes that the retailers provide you. Um, if you want to be in brick and mortar retailers, you should purchase the barcode with your price on it. The barcode is specific to that format is specific to that format because it has the ISBN printed on it. So your paperback has one and your hardcover has another. Um, now I just mentioned a few things on there with price. You're gonna need to figure out your price before you get a barcode if you decide you want a barcode. Um, and if you wanna get into brick and mortar retailers, things to think about, okay? You have questions, I know you do. Um, it's a lot to take in and that was about as high level as I can make it. But I, like I said, I have a boatload, a boatload of videos on this topic for you. They're all gonna be linked below so you can kind of explore that. But the first thing I want you to think about is how will you price your book? Do you wanna be in brick and mortar retailers? Those are the questions you need to answer first before you decide to get a barcode. As far as getting your ISBNs, I strongly advocate that you do own your ISBNs. As far as copyright registration, that's up to you and your risk tolerance. Do you wanna be a little risky and not register? You want to make sure it's registered um, and your budget and all the other things you're spending on. You may think that's $65, like that just puts you too far over. Um, or you may think, no, it's worth the investment to me. But what your gut is telling you is the right answer for you. Okay. All right. So next, we're also going to talk about book descriptions, categories, and keywords. And this to some extent, this is in marketing, but I look at it as a technical setup because you have to input this metadata when you are uploading your books. Um, Usually I say that while your book is with your editors or beta readers or alpha readers, this is a great opportunity to craft your book description, to research what categories you will want to list your book in and what keywords are applicable so you can craft those into your description. It is very important that you do this before you have the cover designed because there is a good chance that the book description is going to be on the back cover of your print book. Um, now within the categories, there is one overarching standard for categories, and that's BSAC codes or BSAC categories. These are book industry standards and communication. Um, I have a video. Um, but these are the overarching categories that any book is listed in, whether you get it out of library, whether you're getting it from Barnes & Noble, traditionally published, any published. There are set categories. There's a finite number of them that every book should fit into. And then there are Amazon categories. Now, these are specific to Amazon.com only because they, as the retailer, can decide, we need to have a whole category for lawnmowers. Like We need to have a whole category for hammers, you know, or, or however they want to snake that down. And that also applies within books. And they can add additional categories as they start to notice more trends or new genres coming or new subgenres coming. Coming, they have control over that. So understanding your BSAC category is very good. You're going to need that for any platform that's on Amazon. 
You're going to have to enter your BSAC categories and they usually let you input three, um, whether it's Ingram Spark or Google Play or any of the other platforms. Um, Amazon, you get to pick two categories for amazon.com when you upload, but you can get up to 10. Um, Dave Chesson from Kindlepreneur, I initially learned that trick from him. He has great content on it. I'll link that below. Um, but effectively, you just go to Author Central and you ask them to add categories. But you need to look those up first. Um, and I have a video on how you can start to do that. Um, and from the categories, you'll also start to find your keywords. Um, now, your keywords are kind of the big buzzwords that like when people go to amazon.com do search for a book um, you would want your book to show up under um, when that word or that phrase is put in um, and you want to somehow organically fit it into your book description um, it will light up based on the book description but also what's in your book so if you think bitcoin's hot right now so i'm gonna put bitcoin as my keyword but my book is about like, fairies and fantasy land and there's no bitcoins mentioned don't do that don't People looking for Bitcoin don't want to read your book. They want to read books about Bitcoin. Okay. okay. All right. And so we have we know the technical setup as far as the ISBNs. If we're getting up our code, our copyright, things like that. Um, we talked about, you know, doing the, the book description and the keywords. And then finally, um, after your book, your manuscript is about as done as it's going to get. We're going to send everything over to cover design and formatting. Um, now with this, you should have your copyright page in the book. The copyright page is different from copyright registration. Um, you need to have a table of contents. And so that all needs to be in the manuscript when you send it out um, to for formatting. Now you can work with a 100 covers and just get your covers done um, and then work with somebody else for the interior. I work with formatted books. It's nice. It's easy. I used to do all the formatting myself. I would go blind on like making sure the the, the indentations were correct um, and then formatting it in like software as well. Um, and then I had a baby and I didn't have time for that anymore. Um, and so formatted books, I send them my book. It comes back. I don't have to do anything. And now they also offer cover services. So I really don't have to do anything else. Um, so I, I like outsourcing that to them. And I will say both formatted books and 100 covers that I mentioned, they offer what I call self-publishing rates. Um, much more affordable than if you were to go to a standalone graphic designer um, who maybe used to work in the traditional publishing industry. They're going to charge you a lot more. You know, they do great work. I, I think all of these companies do great work, but know your budget know the aesthetic you're looking for, things like that. And again, Readsy, um, that service I mentioned for finding editors, you can also find designers there as well. So you have a lot of options. And I would say the price range runs the gamut. You could do all these things for free, figure it out yourself. Um, or you could pay somebody to do it. I think when you do it for free, you're going to get a lot more frustrated. There's a good chance that the manuscript or the cover is going to get kicked back to you by the platforms and you're going to be scrambling to fix it. Um, I think you want to work with somebody who knows books. So that's why I mentioned formatted books or 100 covers or Readsy. Um, going to like, you have a friend who's just good at graphic design. Maybe they design something great for you, but if they don't know the bleed and the margin and they don't know books, specifically the self-publishing platforms, you may have to keep going back and forth with them to get it just right. So keep that in mind. Um, now I'll say this next step is your true final end to editing. And that is when you get to the final print interior and you get the final ebook interior, you are going to do a final proofread of your book before you hit upload. Um, so that way you can check things just right. Um, and anybody you work with who's worth their salt for formatting is going to ask you to look at things and they're going to give you the opportunity to send back um, edits and revisions. And I'll say the same thing for covers. If you think that you hire somebody to do that job for you, that is creative work, and that the very first time they're going to send something back that's perfect and met your wildest expectations, maybe that'll happen. But there's chances are that you're going to need to fine tune things. You're going to need to say, you know, I like this cover, but like, I'm just not feeling the yellow. Can I see this in green? Or, okay, this formatting looks great on the interior, but I really wanted this passage to be italicized and indented. Can we do that? Like, you need to communicate, you need to have realistic expectations, and you need to expect that this will take time. And they're not just going to be able to turn it out for you overnight. Okay. Um, now, once you've done that final proofreading, you can upload to your platforms finally. Yay. Um, before you upload, no, it can be super exciting, right? You have your files, you're all good to go. You're like, sweet. It's like 10 o'clock at night. I'm just going to stay up and upload. No, you're not. 
you're going to stop. You're going to make sure you have a plan. You're going to have order of operations. It's it's so exciting when you have your files and you just want to click all the buttons and you say, screw it. I know I wasn't going to publish for two more months, but I want it out live tonight. This book's going to change the world. And I love your enthusiasm, but you didn't just take almost a year or longer to write and edit this book to rush the upload process. This is where you're actually publishing the book. So if all those platforms we talked about earlier that are going to get your book onto retailers, you're going to set aside time. You're going to go in a very specific order of operations based on your strategy of which retailers you want to be on. Are you doing a pre-order? Are you going to be exclusive with Amazon? All those questions are going to be answered. And from there, you're going to have your order of operations. And that's what you're going to follow when you have dedicated time and you're not rushing it at the end of the night when you're exhausted and just amped on your publishing energy, because that's going to fade really fast once you start getting some error messages or it just takes a while for files or process and things like that, you're going to have a plan. Okay. Okay. But this is exciting because you're actually publishing your book. So don't lose the excitement, but you know, also calm down and have a plan. So finally, we've got to this part with marketing, which is funny because really you should have been marketing your book the whole time, which is why I told you to watch this entire presentation before you start doing anything. Because if you wait to start marketing your book until after you hit upload and publish, it's not going to go too well. I did that with my first book. I was so nervous that it just wasn't going to happen. And I didn't want to talk about it online or promote it to anybody or start to build an audience even because I was like, well, what if it just doesn't happen? What if I don't do it? And I totally understand those set of nerves. But that was a big disservice to me because when I announced that I had a book coming, people were like, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And that was it. I just made the announcement. I hadn't been bringing people along the journey with me talking about I'm drafting. Oh my gosh, I'm so nervous. I sent it you know, out for an, for an edit. And oh, it just came back. I'm super nervous to open the email and wow, I just saw the cover and these concepts are amazing. I don't even know how I could pick one. Like I wasn't bringing people along the journey with me. So what I have learned to do is that you need to start talking about your books when you start writing them. Um, And even once you publish your book, you're going to be marketing it forever and ever for all time. Um, Because you know, you you have to keep telling people it's there. Um, So to be honest, you should start marketing your book right now. Like pause this video go to your social media, tell people you are starting your journey to self-publish your book and to stay tuned for details. Okay, I'll wait. All right, you can't spend a year or more working on this book and then announce that it's live and expect any sales. You need to build an audience and bring them on the journey with you. There are several specific things you can do throughout this process. Now, I am not a salesy person. Um, I am very awkward every time I'm about to hit post on social media to tell people about my books, but you know, I know I need to do it. Otherwise, they're just not they're not going to find out about it. So the number one thing I want you to take away is start marketing on day one, starting to write, hitting a roadblock. What do you do? Um, what do I do with this character? Reading books as research. You got so many words in. You're, the biggest mistake authors make and the biggest mistake that I made with my first book was not talking about it. Talk about your book. All right. Now, when it comes to the actual launch or publication marketing, you're going to want to find advanced readers to give out advanced reader copies or ARCs um, and do some kind of a launch marketing. Um, I used to try to take my own like stylized photos. I am not a photographer. Um, So I was very happy to find book brush um, where you can actually make these beautiful mock-ups. I'll put a few here. Um, Um, And they do have a free version. They do have a paid version. I think with a free version, you can still get a lot of great access, um, but you can download these beautiful photos that you can then upload on social media that makes your book look beautiful and like somebody's reading it. It's great. Um, You should decide who's getting some of these advanced reader copies. How are you going to promote that? You want somebody who's actually going to read the book. Buy your launch date and they're agreeing that they're going to leave an honest review for your book. Um, You're going to follow up and then say, hey, did you read it? Hey, don't forget to leave a review. Um, Usually you cannot post a review until the book is published. If you're doing a pre-order, you have to wait till that time comes. Um, You cannot, you cannot, you cannot incentivize reviews. So if you have an ARC reader, they got a free copy. That's that's what they get. You cannot pay them. You cannot say, hey, once you post your review, let me know. I'll send you a Starbucks gift card. None of that. If Amazon finds out, they can take away all your reviews. They can close on your account. 
I'm serious. Don't do it. Um, the incentive for your ARC readers is that they get the book early. Maybe you say, hey, I'll send you a bonus deleted chapter. I'll send you an alternate ending. I'll do a special Q&A with just my ARC readers and my advanced team and my street team. But like, you're not giving them any kind of financial incentive. Even if it's after the fact, it's considered a financial incentive. Don't do it. Don't. Okay. Now, I've, I've mentioned here doing a pre order or just going straight to publication. That's kind of a question for you to answer for yourself. The pre order gives you time to say, hey, my book is coming out on X date. Go and buy it now. Um, and then you're building up all these orders and they all hit at 12.01 a.m. the day of your publication. It also gives you a chance to keep reminding people that this big thing is coming. Like when people have a deadline, they will act faster than like, hey, my book's live, buy it whenever. They'll be like, oh, well, I'll buy it whenever I get to it, which is never. Um, but if you say, hey, by September 1, buy my book, they're like, okay, August 30th, get in the book. Um, so it's one of those things that helps you to have something to advertise to. Um, but is there, there is there an incentive for them? Are they going to get, again, that bonus chapter? Are they going to get a lower cost? Um, are they going to get a VIP Q&A? Why should somebody pre-order above just making sure they're helping you out to do that? Um, and then once the book is launched, you're marketing it till the end of time, as I said. So um, there's a few places that I do suggest that you focus on um, and you want to be where the readers are. You want to be where your readers are. So in general, readers are on Amazon. They're on Goodreads. They're on BookBub. Um, there's now Bookstagram, BookTok, BookTube, um, where readers are looking for book recommendations. Um, but you know your genre, right? So if you're writing a personal finance book, there is a whole blogosphere, Twitter sphere of people who talk about personal finance. You want to be talking about your book there. If you write children's books, then you actually want to be connecting person to person with school librarians, local librarians, um, people who work with children and their parents to talk about your children's book. So you want to figure out where your readers are. I know a lot of people who say, okay, well, I'm going to try this big flashy thing with Google ads. Like, are people, is that where your readers are? Um, is that... Is that going to be the best bang for your buck? Um, so I always want to caution people, like think about where your readers are, go there, um, standing on a street corner with a spinning sign that says, buy my book. You might have a lot of people see you. You might get a lot of people honking their car horn at you. You might get sunburn, um, but you may not sell any books. So just think about that. Um, and with that, that concludes the processes for self-publishing. So you've done your goal setting, you've done setting up your vision, you have um, written the book, you've edited it, you have done your technical setup, and you have published it. That's it. Done. You've self-published. And you may feel like, well, that's a pretty abrupt ending. And I'll tell you, every time I publish a book, it does feel like a very abrupt ending. Like, oh, I did the thing, so now it's done. And I guess I just do the next one. And so what I want to say is that there's never a point in the book publishing process where you feel like I'm done. I did all the things, even on your launch day, because, OK, well, I need to do this post and I want to reshare this. And OK, I need to thank this and I need to remind my ARC readers. And there's always more to do. And there's never a point where you say, I'm done. I can celebrate. So what I want you to do is I want you to celebrate every big milestone along the way because you wrote a book and it's amazing and the world is going to get to read it. And so when you finish that first draft, have a little celebration. When you send your book off for formatting, have a little celebration. When you get your cover back, do a celebration. When you upload, oh my goodness, and everything is live, do a little celebration. On your launch day, do a celebration because there's always more work to be done and there's never a set time where you feel like, yeah, this is it. I, I did it. I did the thing because you're always chasing after the next thing, right? Or you finish this book. Okay, got to write the next book or I have an idea or you think never again will I ever do a book. And then two days later, you have an idea for one. I guarantee it. So that is the general process. Hopefully I haven't scared too many people away. Do we have anybody still watching? Um, but I want to wish you the best of luck in this process. And you're going to have questions. Please post them below. I may end up responding to your question with a video I've already done answering some of these top questions um, and help you kind of focus on these different rabbit holes. But I hope this has given you the encouragement that this is doable. This is all doable. Um, you know, I, I just learned it from Google and making a lot of mistakes and then I fix my mistakes. Um, but there is a beautiful community here. And if you reach out to other authors um, and ask for support and ask for help and, and just guidance, like you will be surprised and it will be very heartwarming the response that you get from people who want to encourage you because they remember when they were lonely starting out too. So best of luck on your self-publishing journey. 
If you found this information helpful, please turn into the other 2022 AuthorTube writing conference sessions um, and give this video a thumbs up. Hit subscribe to my channel so you can see my new videos I post every week all about self-publishing, or you can even hit that shiny new thanks button um, to support this channel and my mission of helping authors publish. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and now you can get back to writing your book.